Good evening and welcome to The Woman Show. I'm Lenina Rasul. Tonight we're speaking about depression. Now we've chosen this topic for two reasons. One, the most obvious. The world is going through a pandemic. And as a result of national lockdowns, which have happened across the world, including South Africa, many people have lost their jobs, have lost their incomes, and in more, and in more marginalized areas, food poverty has risen. All of this has been extremely frightening and traumatic. And so with people feeling overwhelmed, anxious, and panicked, we were wondering what happens when you tip over and this spills into depression and needs treatment. Another reason is that in conversations with lots of people who have reached out or even just conversations with friends, the topic of depression comes up. But it seems like while we find to speak about it and read about it, it's not so great to have it. It's still a bit embarrassing. So tonight we're going to be speaking to a clinical psychologist about what is depression, the different types of depression, long-term clinical depression versus short-term depressive episodes because those do happen, and what types of tools and treatments are available for us to manage this. But before that, we're going to have a look at a short video from the South African Depression and Anxiety Group looking at debunking some myths about depression. Good day everyone, my name is Zoleka and I'm a Senior Substance Abuse Counselor for SADC. Today we're going to be talking about debunking the myths about depression. So many times people will say things that are not true about depression like get over it or for us black or African people they would say it's not our thing, it's, it's a white disease. Um, what are other things that people say? Get over it, you're weak for men. And a lot of men are accused of being weak because of depression. Guys, it's not true. Depression is a serious mental illness and um, could escalate if it's not tr properly treated. So it's important that we take people seriously, people that are depressed. We need to encourage them. We need to be of um, a positive lending hand to them. So when someone says, I feel alone, take the time to find out why do they feel alone? What has been happening in their life? What has been stressing them for them to feel the way that they're feeling? If someone says, I feel like everything is dark, I'm dragging everyone down, nothing is working out, take that two minutes to find out what has been happening. It's important to be aware and conscious of your stress levels because if your stress is not treated or is not recognized, then it can lead to depression. That was a short video from the South African Depression and Anxiety Group looking at debunking the myths about depression. After the break, we're going to be speaking to a clinical psychologist to unpack this topic further. But before that, let's take a break and we'll be back with more after this. Welcome back, you're still watching The Woman Show. I'm Lenina Rasul, and tonight we're speaking about depression. Now before the break, we watched a short video debunking myths about depression. And one of the things that was mentioned is that often people who are feeling depressed are told to sort of get over it. And what this points to is a misconception about what depression is. Joining us now is clinical psychologist Nomfundo Mugape, who is the executive director for the study of violence and reconciliation and the founding director of the Mental Wellness Initiative. We're going to be speaking about what is depression and just delving a little bit deeper into this topic. Welcome, Numfundo, and thank you so much for joining us. So, thank Numfundo. you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, I'm so glad, and I'm so excited to have you here, Numfundo, for us to speak about this important topic. Obviously, it's depression. Um, and before we sort of get into the nitty gritty, um, I was wondering, could you give us just like a short explanation on what is depression and what are some of the common symptoms? Uh, to identify depression as opposed to just sort of sadness or grief or, or trauma, which in itself is, um, is very serious. But how do we differentiate? Yeah, that's, that's a 
that's an important question. So within just the general classification of mental health disorders, we have the ones that are under the category of mood disorders, there's others that are under personality disorders. Mm -hmm. So depression and anxiety and the trauma fall under the, the category of mood, dis, uh, mood disturbance. So all of them really have to do with a shift in your mood. Uh, depression is the one where there is extreme sadness, but it's different. You know, sometimes when we talk and we deal with people who are depressed and we even do it to ourselves, we would be saying, well, you need to see me a part of it. But depression is, is different. It's not just about, well, I feel sad and, and it's extreme sadness. People describe it as, I feel like I'm in this deep, dark hole mm. and I can't just pull myself out of it. Of course, it's got um, neurological and genetic links to it. So that is depression and we can talk more about the different types of depression. But as anxiety is also still a mood disorder, but it has to do a lot with um, agitation, um, you, you've got stuck with responses, so it's very different. You're not feeling down and anxious and, 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 and depressed like you're in this deep dark hole, but you, you're just not cycled. And trauma tends to be linked with a specific traumatic event. There's a whole description uh, around what trauma is in post-traumatic stress disorder. And I just want to say that, I mean, I do a lot of work around the trauma, and there's a lot of debates in terms of what we understand about trauma and those of us working in South Africa talk a lot about you know collective trauma and, and understanding collective and intergenerational trauma. So that's really just a broad definition between anxiety, depression and uh, and also trauma. Thank you, Numpundo. That that's very interesting. And I, I hear what you're saying about the trauma, especially now there's a global pandemic. A lot of people I imagine are reacting to this pandemic and there's, you know, and then the anxiety and the depression sort of on top of that. Yeah. Um, I wanted to also, so on that topic possibly, depression is often spoken about as sort of a long-term thing. People mention it in broader strokes. Even I think the statement just saying like, I, I have depression is, mm -hmm. you know, sounds so permanent, but do we get, you know, can we experience short periods of depression? And if yes, how is this different to sort of longer term um, or clinical depression? Yeah. So I don't want to explain this. Let me talk about just three broad categories of what we would look at when we look at depression. So there's the kind of depression that is called dysthymia. This is a depression in, in the stomach can be mild, moderate, or even severe. But this is the kind of depression that takes place over a long period of time it just becomes your own, your underlying mood. And most of the time, we're not even aware of it. I mean, I learned in my 20s that when I was growing up, I actually had dysthymia. But I didn't even know that it was it because it's so, so normal to you. So living with this sense of like emptiness, of um, low self-esteem, inadequacy, just the sense that there's just sadness, lack of energy, it affects your appetite and, and sometimes your sleep. But this is usually a, a mood that just happens over a long period of time. There's also another one that I think is important to highlight here, bipolar. With bipolar, what you find is that people shift between a major depressive mood and also what we call manic episodes. So they have depressive manic episodes and manic episodes. And the depressive episodes are very similar to dysthymia. Uh, so is the hopelessness, the sadness, the emptiness, the sleep is affected. But then they could also move to manic where when people are manic, they really take risky behavior. They are very jumpy. They've got rapid speech. They've got lots of energy. They wake up in the air. They sleep very late at night and wake up. You can even see just my energy the way in which I am talking about it. And it can be like episodes. For some people, it can happen in a day. You know, they've got a manic episode and mm. it's depressive. For some people, it's seasonal. You know, it could be in winter or summer. And then, most of the time, when we talk about depression, we tend to refer to what we call major depression. So, major depression, you can have, some people can have just one episode. Or if it's just one brief episode, something might have happened that just takes you there. And we really recommend to people that when that initial episode happened, 
call for an intervention early on. Because sometimes then what happens is that people can have multiple episodes. You can, you know, have a depression episode. Maybe some people will say, yes, I'll go ahead one. And then there's another one a few years later. So people can have several uh, depressive episodes. And the symptoms are very similar to dysthymia, but you also like some of the things that you find is like tiredness, suicidal ideation, because what makes depression so difficult is just like you are in this deep, dark hole of hopelessness. Just, you know, things seem very hopeless. It is more about your perception and your understanding of things. Your mood tends to be very flat, appetite gets affected, people really struggle. Either they oversleep or struggle to sleep. But I think the important thing is the impact that it has. So what we, when we really begin to look at it as a disorder is when it infiltrates significant areas of your life, right? It impacts your relationship. It impacts your capacity to function at work. It impacts your own health and how you are taking care of yourself. That's when then we're saying, look, that maybe you are entering into, and also just your own self-care. You know, you are somebody, you may be somebody who used to like bright colors and all of a sudden you just don't, you don't care what you're putting on, mm. you're taking care of your hair, you know, taking care of yourself. So um, I think that's what we can describe as, as, as major depression. We do have, I will put it in inverted commas, like functional depressed people, especially the high achievers who actually use their work as an outlet mm. but by the time they finish working they are so depleted because they are trying to just suppress these emotions and 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 to use work as an escape of, of sitting with the emotions thank you Numfundo. and it's great that you mentioned sort of um how this manifests in the daily life because you said something important you said you know in your 20s you um you realized that you actually had depression, but it had been so normalized. And I think, uh, you know, that's part of the confusion. Um, and, and in that, and I, I can personally relate to that even. I mean, I used to use, eventually, I would use for myself how many days I've gone without a shower as a measure of whether I'm in a depressive episode or not. And it's taken me a long time to actually admit that because hygiene is so embarrassing. But... Um, um, but it's those little tells that we have to figure out because you, you just don't know sort of when you're slipping into it. And so yeah. um, can I ask then, when you find that people do reach a state where they reach out for an intervention, um, is it usually where they've noticed things like that about themselves? I think I'm interested in the space where we slip over from a space where, oh, you just need to snap out of this, you know, we don't know what's wrong, we know we don't feel okay, but it's still sort of normalized. And I think especially if yeah. one has had it for such a long time, at what point do you find yeah. people eventually take the step and reach out uh, for an intervention? Yeah. Uh, and actually, I mean, before I even answer the question of um, at what point do people come, I just want to highlight you know, the context of South Africa because we do learn a lot about mental health health disorders, mm. I mean, they are global across the world. But I, when I even start talking to people about why it is so difficult for us to be even awake to it, I do a lot of work in letting people appreciate, I call it, you know, I call South Africa a wounded context, mm. that most of us experience this depressive episode in a wounded context, in a context where we are dealing with sort of historical wounding as a society, right? People will call it trauma, but I use wounding. We're just not feeling good about yourself is, has been normalized because we had a society that was designed to make a people feel that the, your worth as a human being is defined by how you look or the color of your skin. So there is that historical wounding that we carry. But also, it is not just historical. One of the things that we know is that this wounding is transferred from one generation to another. And even worse in South Africa, I mean, it's, it's embedded in our institutions. When I started traveling in my 30s outside South Africa and I went to country, most of them developing countries, some of course in the continent, I was just amazed at how the whole architecture, even the design of the society was to support you and, and, and confirm your worth. You get into the workplace, it sees you, it acknowledges you, you call an ambulance, it responds immediately. Now, I, I am highlighting this because 
when we begin to talk about mental disorders in a country like South Africa, with such deep-seated wounding, then we have to really understand that one of the challenges is that we have become so asleep to just how broken we are as a people. Mm. A lot of South Africans do not ask for help. We have normalized the depression. I think for me, it's because when I started doing psychology and I actually learned about dysthymia, I was like, oh, there's actually a description for this thing. We grew up in a culture where even our own parents had to survive. They couldn't even see that we're not okay, that we are actually struggling in a society that did not see us. So being awake to it, and it's only now after I've done some work in my 40s when I'm like, oh my gosh, Auntie, this is what it means to be happy. This is what it means to be at peace. We don't even know that we are not okay. So I think for me, it's really important to, fight, to, 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 to highlight that because in South Africa, prioritizing your mental wellness is like almost going against the grain. You know, in our language, they would even say we are papa. You know, you think you're better, you are too fast, like why, or, or you are spoiled, mm. or because we really, and understand the importance of being away. So, that being said, the things that you can acknowledge, first of all, is that it is not normal to grow up with this just deep-seated sense of emptiness. So if you wake up in the morning and it's your norm to feel empty, it's possible that you have dysthymia. And dysthymia tends to really just operate. It's an under, it's not deep, deep mood, but you just, you're not happy, it's not normal. Yes, we are human beings. Now and again, we may not be happy, but for you to just constantly live in a state of being completely unhappy. But most importantly, I think you really need to seek help when it starts to affect your appetite, you overeat or you undereat, when it starts affecting your sleep, you are, you've got insomnia, you are not sleeping, or you are sleeping too much. Also, when it starts affecting your relationships, you don't have quality relationships that you feel that you know, you need at least one or two relationships where you feel fulfilled and, and, and content. So when, when some of these things happen, I think for me, all I can say is this general sense of just not being happy and struggling. Please take it seriously and go ask for help. It may be depression, it may be anxiety, it may be trauma, but just go to a professional and ask for help and they will give you a proper diagnosis and with proper treatment because depending on the type of mental health issue you have, the hormones and the neurobiological processes are different and therefore you need a different medication. Thank you, Numfundo. That's very really interesting. I mean, I'm going to veer off just for a second to say, you know, I read a quote the other day from the Dalai Lama who said, um, the point of life is happiness. And it was... Um, it's so simple and yet it was so profound for me because, you know, as we move through these mm -hmm. different feelings in life, it's exactly what you're saying, actually. You know, where the, the perception is, is that we think we, we better or we deserve better or th those are even things we tell ourselves. But really, the point of well-being is to feel happy and good and, and that should be okay. Um, so you raise really, really interesting points. Um, around that and then also around sort of this, this structure that we're existing in that doesn't encourage well-being and doesn't encourage feeling happy. Um, on the topic of that though, um, you know, we're looking at treatment options. Everybody is very familiar with uh, antidepressants. So if you, depression often, you know, if you experience depression or you talk about it, often um, the topic of antidepressants comes up. What I found, especially recently and in conversations with other women who have phoned and, uh, you know, spoken with me and just said, I, I feel like I'm in a dark hole, I'm just not happy, and then would whisper, or oh, we're on the phone, they'd whisper, I'm taking some antidepressants. And it was interesting to me that it's still such a taboo topic, because these are, yeah. you know, women that I wouldn't think would be um, embarrassed about it. To me it's become a little bit mainstream in terms of uh, how it's depicted in media and on television. Um, do you think it's still very taboo? And aside yeah. from antidepressants, what other treatments are there? Yeah, look, I think that the issue of stigma is still a big problem in South Africa, a huge problem. So in our country, first of all, it's just difficult to be awake. And anyone who is even awake and saying, I've got a problem, kudos to you. You are already 50% there. 
because that's the biggest, biggest problem in South Africa. We are just so asleep to the brokenness. But even when people become awake, there is so much stigma. And some of the stigma is really completely around ignorance. And I've started shifting my conversations, you know, with my daughters, where I start them early. And I say, I mean, studies have shown that the brain can't differentiate between emotional pain and physical pain. The same areas and chemicals that uh, get affected when you experience emotional pain is exactly the same as physical pain. So I would say to my daughter, if you were to go out there and be hit by a bus, you know, will you then be embarrassed that you have to take treatment? She'd be like, no. So I've I started to teach her to just learn that mental wellness is exactly the same as physical wellness. It's mm -hmm. just that the body sometimes it registers it mentally. So it's, it's very important to frame that and to appreciate that you live again, I come back to this, in a wounded society that will not be even able to celebrate you being awake to yourself or even support you. So do not expect necessarily, and you're lucky if you've got family members that support you, don't expect people to really support you. If you can, can get one friend who can support you, that's great. But please do understand that though you are choosing a path that is actually the best path for you and for your loved ones, there is likely to be a lot of stigma around this. I mean, I have worked with professional women who are executives, but they are still so ashamed because we have a society, unfortunately, that has equated uh, mental, mental wellness or mental health issues with weakness. Mm. We think you are weak if you've got mental health issues. And I actually say to people, it is the brave that stand up and are able to acknowledge that they have these mental health issues. So medication is really important. There's, there's again, quite a, a lot of misconceptions around medication. One thing that we know is that depression is also a, a, a hormonal disease. It's a neurobiological disease. And it really helps to have medication just, just helps to balance those hormones. You can Google there's various medications and they've got different side effects. And I always say to people, if your doctor gives you one medication and the side effects are really severe, just go back to them. The doctors have got so many options and people react differently. I mean, depending on their own neurobiological and hormonal processes, go to the doctor until you really get um, a medication that assists you. Some of them is, I always say to people, you know, medication deals with the symptoms, but counseling deals with the underlying factors and the cognitive behavioral approaches that actually look at your thinking processes, that looks at your emotions and behavior, because there's a very, very strong correlation between what you think, what you feel, and what you do. So they are really able to help you. So some of us have got such automated thoughts, for example, about our worth. And, and remember, again, I've just said that we've got intergenerational transferred sense of worthlessness as a society because of how we grew up. And these thinking processes are shaping our inner dialogue. They are shaping the relationship we have with ourselves. They are shaping the things we are saying to ourselves about ourselves. And in turn, they are shaping our emotions. And then in turn, they are shaping the, the thought, the, our the actions and behavior. So counseling really helps you to find out what the root causes of the depression is and for you to be able to deal with it. And again, I want to emphasize, I remember when I was starting as a psychologist, it was compulsory that we also go and get therapy. But I couldn't click with my therapist, like at so many levels. And I wasn't trained enough to say, no, a therapy is like a relationship. Try it until you really find someone who speaks to you that you resonate with. Different people speak to different people. So seek out for a therapist that will work for you. So you can also have like behavioral management um, interventions that help you if you're really struggling with your sleep, the sleep treatment that can be done to help you if it's diet, exercise. There can be people who help you with that. The stress management techniques, some of the people could just be that you are overwhelmed, you need to learn how to do that. If your issue is social withdrawal, they can train you in social interaction and how to deal with it. But we really know that when you are depressed, usually the thing that you don't want is to be around people because it stresses you the most. Yes. But we really encourage that be around, of course, people that are positive, that are supportive, that are caring in your life. 
don't pull away from the people that care for you. Yes, Even and Lumpundo, sorry, we just have to yes. take a short break quickly, but we're going to come back and okay. carry the conversation after this. Welcome back. You're still watching The Woman Show, and tonight we're speaking about depression. Now, before the break, we were chatting to clinical psychologist Nomfundo Mugape about what is depression, what does it look like, what are the symptoms, and some of the treatments in order to address this issue. But now we want to look into what does depression look like in other people? How can we recognize it? And especially as women who are often caregivers in the home, we find that we're responsible for the rest of the family. So what do we do if one of our children, our spouse, our family members, or even our colleagues look like they are going through a rough time and not handling it? What are things that we can do to help? Numfunda joins us again so that we can chat about this. So Numfunda, we're back with the conversation. And before the break, we were speaking about sort of treatment options. I think you mentioned uh, antidepressants. You were speaking about counseling, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and they all sounded really good. And I think we ended off with you saying to just, you know, find even if it's at least one person that can support you. Um, and to also not turn away from that person. I, I just want to carry on from that. I do want to ask about our role um, and depression in other people. So, you know, there's a context where women also, especially, are often the caregivers in our home. We are often nurturers, um, even in other spaces mm -hmm. at work and so forth. And so I found it interesting in terms of how do we you know, deal with other people's depression. So if I'm at home, I see my sister, my mother, my brother, or even my child is, you know, just very, doesn't have any energy, you know, there seems to be a really dark mood hanging, they don't want to speak, they just seem like there's no meaning. And we've been seeing, you know, we know that teen suicide is high. We know that young people are struggling to find meaning in everyday life. I mean, I think yeah. the first question I think is like, how can we identify whether it is depression or it is a mood disorder that is quite serious and the person needs help? Yeah, so it, it's really difficult, especially with um, teenagers to know what is what, because you, you never know. <laughs> I've got a teenage daughter, and you don't know, like, is she on a period, what's happening? Mm. It's very difficult. But, I mean, and, and even as I'm saying this, I understand it is not easy. But it really helps to know your, your, your child, to spend time with them. I, I always say that, I, you know, I insist, if you, if you can, to drive my kids, because I can look them in the eye every day. And when I know them, then I can see if there is a shift in their mood or change in behavior. Because really the way you can see it is if there's a change. You, you know how a person needs to be, and then you can start seeing that normal. This person, like their room is untidy, their mood is down all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and find, I think the, the first thing that I just want to emphasize is that you have to take care of yourself first, right? As you're looking after the people, you can't sacrifice yourself because you need that psychological energy to be able to contain the, the people's sadness and not be pulled down. And the second thing is, it's not your responsibility to make them snap out of it. So you can't be telling them, no, you need to snap out of it. You just need to indicate to them that, look, I see you're going through a really difficult time. I am here for you, and I am here to support you no matter what you need. For teenagers, I mean, we find that teenage girls are, tend to be much more open to counseling than teenage boys. I just uh, boys tend to be more open when they are younger. But if you can, really suggest to them that if they can talk to you because you are their aunt or their parent, just ask if you can refer them to someone. They might reject it, but sometimes it's hard to just say to them, look, when you are ready, it is an option, and I am prepared to support you around it. And I wanted to, just before we close, I did want to talk about suicidal ideation and suicide. Mm. 
And, and the difference between, you know, societal ideation is when you have the thoughts of wanting to take your life. Um, when people start talking about, uh, about that, you have to really take it seriously. But what we ask that you really need to watch out for, especially for your teenagers, watch out and see if they have a plan. So if somebody has a plan, it's moved from just being an ideation, they are really like actively looking at what they need to do. And when they are in that space of like actively thinking about suicide, it's really important that you never leave them alone at home. There might be times where they just need to be hospitalized until they are actually stable and they are able to come back. But it's really the subtle symptoms. It's so difficult for parents to get through their kids. If you are close to their friends, mm. we can even just check with that breaking confidence to say, I'm really worried, you know, is there anything I need to know to try and help her? If you're really picking anything, just talk to me so that I can be able to be there for them. But I think the most important thing is that it can be very, very difficult to live with someone who has depression. Sometimes you may feel guilty, you may want to then make them snap out of it, you might be irritable. Sometimes you become irritable with teenagers and shout at them as if they can just actually shift. They can't just snap out of it. Uh, medication might be really important in counseling. Um, that's a very important point you raised, Nimfundo, about um, you know, the suicide ideation and whether someone has verbalized it whether they're starting to plan. And I think I'd like to ask, so if you are in a position, and I think this has come up in teen, suicide, in teen suicides, where if you track back, you'll find out perhaps a friend was told, someone was told, and there's also a veil of secrecy around it, you know, yeah. um, which causes us to not to reach out and tell someone. But, you know, in the context of teenagers, in the context of adults, so I'm a grown woman, my friend, um, mentions that she's feeling, she's feeling depressed. She's thinking about suicide, or she mentions it. Um, she asks me not to tell anybody. What do I do with that information? So, I mean, one thing that we always say is that the first principle is around ensuring that people don't harm themselves. Yeah. We even say, for example, when we are doing therapy or counseling, we tell people that look, I will keep confidentiality um, as much as I can. But at any time when I feel that you are a danger to yourself or others, I might have to break that. So no matter how much you really care for and love your friend, if you think that they are a danger to themselves, you might need to break that confidentiality. They might hate you, they might have a problem with you, but the priority is actually their well-being and their health. So just really watch out for those. If they're already saying, they, you know, uh, I've got pills. So when they say, I feel like, because people who are depressed do talk about taking their lives and mm. things very all blessed. So listen to them and, and try to ask questions like, oh, my friend, you know, how are you thinking? Have you even thought about how you're going to do this? How are you feeling? How frequently do you think about it? And just see if it seems like the pain is really concrete. You might need to confidentially tell the people around them to say, please. Uh, sometimes I would call people and say, please just make sure you don't leave them alone. They must never be alone at any one time. Mm. Just be around them. If you might have seen them actively taking the pills or trying to do that, they might need to be hospitalized. I think we, as much as we can, love for our people people, we might have to bring that tough love. Because when you're in that space of suicidal and you are now trying to take your life, it's really no longer about hiding. It's actually more dangerous to not be supportive. Um, and if your friend is depressed, for me, I think the first thing is what makes people pull back is when they feel judged. Mm. So to really be able to create an environment that says, look, friend, I am here for you. So with my daughter, it really helped because she had gone through that period and, um, and, and I mean, some of the friends, a lot of our teenagers go through this. And this thing of saying to them, look, if you came to me and you said a head, you have a headache, I would have treated it. And for me, depression is exactly like a headache because, again, your brain does not differentiate. It's exactly the same thing. So we have to start shifting how we talk about it and how we respond. Sometimes when people tell us we also panic and that panic and anxiety that they hear from us um, also contributes to say, oh, this is a red flag. Mm. My friend is unable to hold my pain or even deal with it.
Thank you, Numfundo. I mean, that, that, is, that is great. And I think, you know, you're on point in terms of uh, thinking about the judging. It's really hard. And it's also what, you know, causes us to hold a lot of this inside, we're afraid. And I think you mentioned yeah. earlier yeah. also, it's often associated with weakness. Um, yeah. Just to go in, we've got a wrap up soon, but you founded the okay. um, Mental Wellness Initiative. Can you tell us a bit more about that and, and what is it really and what does the Mental Wellness Initiative do? Yeah, thank you. So the Mental Wellness Initiative, MWI, we started it last year around April as a response to COVID-19. So it is really an initiative which is a network of organizations that are dealing with mental health and mental wellness issues. So life coaches, psychologists, social workers, and for us, the idea was that when COVID hit, we had appreciated the, the, the nature of woundedness in our society, as I've described it, and that COVID was going to hit us not just at a physical or economic level, but also at an emotional level. And that if we are really going to bounce back as a society, we will have to start prioritizing mental wellness. And there are a lot of organization. I'm also a director of the Center for the Study of Violence and Reconciliation, where we are the secretariat, we've got other organizations. There's a lot of organizations like CSPR, SADC, Lifeline, a lot of other organizations that have been doing great work over the years. But the idea of the mental wellness is that we need to come back together and collectively have a collective approach towards addressing mental wellness because the problem is too huge for organizations to just be operating separately. And some of these organizations don't even have enough time to fundraise for themselves. So Mental Wellness uh, works as an organization that actually goes, brings the people together, but we go and mobilize funds to support people in the sector to go and do the work. We want to develop materials together that we can share. There's a lot of best practice models out there that are working but these have not been escalated where we are sharing with each other. So that is really the idea of the Mental Wellness Initiative. And we are really fortunate that um, like Ford Foundation is supporting us now around the sexual and gender-based violence field around how to support leaders in the field to deal with the, to ensure that they are actually resilient and their organizations are resilient. So we just started new organization, but um, really excited that the work is keeping. That's great. No, just to end off, um, I mean, I think it's fantastic. We know that there is too little uh, mental health services in South Africa to cater for every, everyone. I think I saw a stat that said one in 10 people have access. But just in terms of tools yeah. and materials, um, I, for instance, often find, you know, I'm a reader. So I find when I'm dipping really low, it helps sometimes just to go into Google, just to go in, you mm. know, Google depression tools. Um, yeah. And maybe go and, you know, speak to, depending on who it is. I've done Lifeline. Lifeline offers, um, I think it's three or four free sessions. And I think now they're doing yeah. it via, um, via Zoom and WhatsApp and the other organizations. But to you, my philosophy is very much that every little, that even little bits count. Um, yeah. And so do you have any suggestions where people are feeling really low? It might not be like, you know, clinical depression or dangerous, but are there little things we can do just to, you know, sort of lift ourselves up? Yeah. I think the first, the first one is somebody said something really powerful that has happened in 2021. She said, you know, 2021 is really a 2020 take it one day at a time, like literally. Because what gets overwhelming with depression is when you get so overwhelmed by the future or get stuck in the past. Just live in the moment where you are at and understand that this period that you are in is not going to last forever, right? Um, and secondly, I like what you said, ask for help. Just, again, it's really difficult when you're feeling depressed, but push through it. Talk to someone, get some kind of support. Even if it is difficult to get out of bed, you know, sometimes it helps to just have a little bit of sunshine, walk a little bit. Mm. And secondly, some people even keep like a gratitude journal because you know the brain is amazing our thoughts are very powerful if you have one negative thought they all pull together like a magnet and when you are depressed it's even stronger so even sh shifting and identifying one thing small things it doesn't have to be big things even to say you know i can be 
read, I've got friends. Just have a gratitude journal where you bring your, your, your brain to even identify the things that are working in your life. But again, please do go to the doctor or the psychologist if you can and just get medication. It really, really does help. But most importantly, remember, you matter. You matter. And your mental wellness matter. And it's important to focus on yourself. It is not being selfish when you're focusing on yourself. Because we understand that if you are okay, then the people that you love will be okay. Your workplace will be okay. We have to begin to just shift our understanding of mental wellness work. That it is as much as work as it is standing up and going to work. It is as much work as standing up and cooking if you cook or doing the garden if you're doing it. Mm. Because most of the time we don't see it as a crucial component of work. And, and celebrate it. If you've got depression and you're able to wake up and have a shower, well done. Who gets yes. to you? That is your most important work at this point in time. I completely agree. I actually, I have a, um, in my diary, whenever I've done anything, I take a red pen. I saw this in a book and I write victory. You know, it's just like something yes. that I started, but it, it makes me feel as if I've really achieved something, yeah. even if it's a shower or breakfast yeah. or um, anything. Nompunda, that brings us to the end of our, of our discussion, but thank, thank you yeah. so very much for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you, guys. Bye. All the best. Take care of yourself, please. These are difficult times. That was clinical psychologist Nompundo Mogapi, who is the executive director for the study of violence and reconciliation and the founding director of the Mental Wellness Initiative, giving us more information and insight about depression, both in ourselves but in others as well. Now, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be back with more after this. Welcome back. You're still watching The Woman Show and we're speaking about depression. Now, we've heard quite a lot about what depression is, what the symptoms are, what the treatments are, and how depression manifests in other people. But it's still very difficult to recognize and to explain when you're in it. This video from the World Health Organization has been quite popular in sort of showcasing what depression looks like from an, um, in real life. Let's have a quick look and we'll be back with more after that. I had a black dog. His name was Depression. Whenever the black dog made an appearance, I felt empty and life just seemed to slow down. He could surprise me with a visit for no reason or occasion. The black dog made me look and feel older than my years. When the rest of the world seemed to be enjoying life, I could only see it through the black dog. Activities that usually brought me pleasure suddenly ceased to. He liked to ruin my appetite. He chewed up my memory and my ability to concentrate. Doing anything or going anywhere with the black dog required superhuman strength. At social occasions, he'd sniff out what confidence I had and chase it away. My biggest fear was being found out. I worried that people would judge me. Because of the shame and stigma of the black dog, I was constantly worried that I'd be found out. So I invested vast amounts of energy into covering him up. Keeping up an emotional lie is exhausting. Black dog could make me think and say negative things. He could make me irritable and difficult to be around. He would take my love and bury my intimacy. He loved nothing more than to wake me up with highly repetitive and negative thinking. He also liked to remind me how exhausted I was going to be the next day. Having a black dog in your life isn't so much about feeling a bit down, sad or blue. At its worst, it's about being devoid of feeling altogether. As I got older, the black dog got bigger and he started hanging around all the time. I'd chase him off with whatever I thought might send him running. But more often than not, he'd come out on top. Going down became easier 
and getting up again. So I became rather good at self-medication, which never really helped. Eventually, I felt totally isolated from everything and everyone. The black dog had finally succeeded in hijacking my life. When you lose all joy in life, you can begin to question what the point of it is. Thankfully, this was the time that I sought professional help. This was my first step towards recovery and a major turning point in my life. I learned that it doesn't matter who you are, the black dog affects millions and millions of people. It is an equal opportunity mongrel. I also learned that there was no silver bullet or magic pill. Medication can help some and others might need a different approach altogether. I also learned that being emotionally genuine and authentic to those who are close to you can be an absolute game changer. Most importantly, I learned not to be afraid of the black dog and I taught him a few new tricks of my own. The more tired and stressed you are, the louder he barks. So it's important to learn how to quiet your mind. It's been clinically proven that regular exercise can be as effective for treating mild to moderate depression as antidepressants. So go for a walk or a run and leave the muck behind. Keep a mood journal. Getting your thoughts on paper can be cathartic and often insightful. Also keep track of the things that you have to be grateful for. The most important thing to remember is that no matter how bad it gets, if you take the right steps, talk to the right people, black dog days can and will pass. I wouldn't say that I'm grateful for the black dog, but he's been an incredible teacher. He forced me to reevaluate and simplify my life. I learned that rather than running away from my problems, it's better to embrace them. The black dog may always be part of my life, but he'll never be the beast that he was. We have an understanding. I've learned through knowledge, patience, discipline and humour, the worst black dog can be made to heal. If you're in difficulty, never be afraid to ask for help. There is absolutely no shame in doing so. The only shame is missing out on life. And that brings us to the end of the show for this evening. If you or someone you know is experiencing depression or depressive symptoms, the best thing that you can do is reach out for help. If you feel you have no one to speak to, you can call the South African Depression and Anxiety Group hotline. The number is on the screen right now. Thank you for joining us. I'm Lenina Rasul. Good night. Thank you.